from Fairfax, Virginia, this is Out of the Past with Chuck Langdon and Lee Shepard, an in-depth discussion with some of the most fascinating people of our time, many of them with strong area connections. Now, today's Out of the Past. Welcome to Out of the Past. On this program, we are continuing the series, Local Broadcast Legends. Before he retired in 1997, our guest worked for WMAL for 50 years, and 32 years of that was on the Harden and Weaver Show. Let's meet Frank Harden. Frank? Thank you very much Thank for inviting you. Let, me. Let's go back to the beginning. Where did you come from? Well, I was born in Macon, Georgia. I was brought up in Savannah, Georgia. And uh, from a poor and poverty-stricken family. <laughs> it, uh, it, I can remember those days. It was during the Depression. I was born when Warren G. Harding was president in 1922. Uh -huh. That makes me an oldie, doesn't it? So <laughs> when and how did you get into broadcasting, Frank? Well, I got out of the Army in 1944, a medical discharge, about six days before D-Day in 1944, and I knew that my $300 mustering out pay wasn't going to last that long, and I'm sure that my father would have gotten tired of my asking for sustenance, and so I decided to get into broadcasting. Taking my father's advice, he said, remember, son, no heavy lifting. And so I noticed that the radio announcer always sat down, and that appealed to me. So I went down to WSAV in Savannah, Georgia. There were only two stations there at the time. There must be a dozen now. But anyway, went to WSAV. The manager of the station was a man by the name of Harbin Daniel. And he said, and you would like a job? I said, yes, as an announcer. He said, have you had any experience as an announcer? I said, no. He said, well, let me give you an audition. So he gives me couple of pieces of paper and I went in, started reading, and he said, he came rushing in, he said, you sure you've never, done no, never, he said, when can you start? I said, this afternoon if you want me to. So that's how I started in radio. <laughs> and where did you go then? Were you After uh, almost a year in Savannah, I wound up in Atlanta, Georgia, at WGST, which is a CBS station, had a very good time there. And then for some reason or the other, and I can't exactly put my finger on it, it probably was wifely pressure, but we decided that Denver, Colorado was a beautiful place. We'll go out there. So I did get a job at KLZ in Denver. Stayed there for about a year and then came to Washington. What type of music or format did you have? At, at KLZ? At KLZ. It was a CBS station. We just made station breaks, and they had some uh, mountain-type music, live shows, and agricultural shows, and things like that. But I was, I was just a staff announcer. So then the move to Washington. Then the move to Washington. One day, when I was in Atlanta, I had a very good friend who was a fellow announcer, and uh, I heard him on the air. He was on ABC. He was introducing a guy by the name of Balkage. Bach is talking, so I said, I think I'll call Charlie and see if, uh... so I got in touch with Charlie. He says, you know, I was just thinking about you the other day. He says, we're having auditions for an announcer here at WMAL, ABC. So I, he said, send us a, a, a recording. So I said, okay, they didn't have tape in those days. Big acetate recording. I went to another station and made the record. I still have never heard that record. But uh, so the program director called me a couple of days later and said, when can you come? I said, I'll be there on Christmas Eve. So on Christmas Eve, 1947, I started at WMAL. As an announcer? As an announcer. That was on ABC, and in those days, you'd, the staff announcer, of which there were nine of us, simply made station breaks, introduced news, and that kind of thing. And you were the voiceover for, uh, or on the Lone Ranger? And yes, the, the Lone Ranger was on ABC. The Lone Ranger originated in Detroit. In the northern part of the country, it was sponsored by General Mills. In the southern part of the country, everything south of Washington, 
It was sponsored by American Bakeries, Marita Bread, uh, out of Atlanta. And so I did the uh, commercials for Marita Bread for the Lone Ranger for a period of probably two years, three years, something like that. And then there was the Edward P. Morgan Show. That started out uh, with John W. Vandercook. And then uh, he, for some reason, disappeared. I forget what it was now. But anyway, Edward P. Morgan came along, and then I was his announcer for about 11 years, as a matter of fact. We know the, the famous Hardin and Weaver program, and is there... That started in 1960. What happened was that uh, Weaver, Weaver was a staff announcer at the same time that I was a staff announcer. And uh, we got to know each other. And quite frankly, we, I don't want to say stole material, but we, we borrowed material <laughs> from uh, the Breakfast Club, uh, Ranson Sermon, and the, uh, what do you call it, Club Matinee, a program out of San Francisco, Jack Kirkwood, and Birth and Madness. And those things, we said, we could do a program like that. We always joke between each other. And so we came up with a format, a 15-minute format. We called it Frank and Jackson. And a man by the name of Ray Diaz was, was program director of ABC Radio. And we approached him with it, and he said, sure. So at 11.15 at night, we did a program on ABC called Frank and Jackson. More people heard it in Albuquerque than heard it here. But anyway, uh, that's how they, we got started on that. We did that for about a year, and then the morning program became available on WMAL. And the manager came in and said, how would you all like to audition? He had several people who were auditioning for the program, and he chose us. And you had been announcing, so this was your first time to actually be doing something other than just announcing four programs. Oh, I did a couple of 15-minute uh, record programs and things like that. I, I don't even recall it, what we call them. <laughs> Mr. Music, we call one of them. <laughs> How did this magic, Harden and Weaver, you, you had that 15-minute program mm -hmm. to kind of get a That's sense right, of yeah, each other. Yeah. And, and then the uh, WMAL asked you to take over that morning. Slot. The morning broadcast. Jimmy Gibbons had left, and Bill Malone was in the process of leaving. And so they were getting someone to fill in to do it. And so we, uh, we auditioned, and they decided on us. And the format that we arrived at, in those days, the focus was on entertainment. Nowadays, it's on topical and, and people yelling at each other and controversy. I think the most controversial thing we ever said was good morning. But anyway, we, uh, the focus was on entertainment. So we played music. We, ad we never had a rehearsal that I know of, that I can remember. So we just sat down and, and did the program. All that was just ad-libbing between the All two. was ad-libbing, and uh, Jackson was the consummate actor. He was uh, uh, brilliant. I, he was the voice of Smokey the Bear. I don't know if you know that or not, but he was the voice of Smokey. And so when we were doing the program, he would do not impersonations, but, but voice characterizations. In other words, a stereotypical characterization of whoever. The, we had a senator. The senator was, uh, he was kind of the amalgam of everything that was un, unlikely in a public servant, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, th had a woman, he was, he was straight, had a woman, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. then we had uh, a, uh, a psychiatrist, a music director, all kinds of people like that, that we, that he could characterize. And uh, I'll never forget, in radio, you know, it, 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 it involves the imagination of the listener as much as it does that of the, the performer. And so we had this, this lady's voice on there, which Jackson did. And when we would make personal appearances, someone would come up and say, oh, by the way, did you bring Bertha or Martha or something? They even had names yeah, for her. Yeah. Or called her a fat lady. We never said she was fat or skinny or tall or short. But uh, as I say, the imagination of the listener worked in there. And the senator, of course, was 
attended more cocktail parties than he did quorum calls. <laughs> and uh, our, our psychiatrist was was uh, very funny. He, he, I'll never forget one time he said, "Now I don't want to go into into something too technical or." I'd, I'd, I should try to put it in lay language, which I can't do. It is very involved. But that person is nutty as a fruitcake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Frank, how did you bait Jackson into performing these characters? Well, uh, many times the character wasn't even established. He would invent it upon my baiting. Uh, I'll never forget one time we had a sponsor, Rockmont Chevrolet. And so when we did the commercial, I invented a character. I said, as Rocky Rockmont always says, and Jackson picked it up, and he invented this character of Rocky Rockmont. And we used him from then on in the commercials. And so then somebody called us and told us that every salesman at that Chevrolet place had a, had a little button that said, I'm Rocky. <laughs> but anyway, they, uh, it wasn't hard to bait him. Now, the only impersonation that he did was Lawrence Welk, and he did it perfectly. And one time, I'll never forget, on his way to the airport, Lawrence Welk had been in town, and he decided to call Hardin and Weaver. So he called us on the phone, <laughs> and Jackson went into the Lawrence Welk impersonation. And here are the two of them are talking to me, and I couldn't decide who's putting who on, you know. <laughs> It, it was funny. It was very, very funny. <laughs> and that reminds me, you had some personalities come on that program and visit you, didn't you, that pretty regularly? Oh, yes. Do you remember a, a stage production called A Tuna Christmas? Yes. Played down at one. Well, those two guys would come on every time they came to town. And they were very, very funny, very good. And then there were others, uh, anybody who came in town. Uh, a good friend of ours was an ex-congressman who listened to the program all the time, uh, Elliot Hagan from Georgia. Every year on, in February, they have Founders Day in Savannah, Georgia. That was the first settlement in Georgia. And he invited us down for the big celebration on Founders Day. And the governor of Georgia at that time was Jimmy Carter. When the parade started, he got out of the, uh, the chariot, horse-drawn, and started walking. So the, the inauguration that he had, where he got out of the car and started walking, was not the first time that he did that. <laughs> yeah. And then you did a, a, a many remotes, didn't you? Yes, we did programs from uh, as far away as Montreal, Canada, from Dublin, Ireland, uh, from London. I think one of, the, one of the highlights of my radio career in 1939, I had fallen deeply in love with Ingrid Bergman. I saw Casablanca. I'd, I'd go every afternoon after school to see it. And so uh, she granted us an interview. She was appearing at the Haymarket Theater in London. And we had a 15-minute interview scheduled. And we went to talk to Ingrid Bergman. And we stayed there for over an hour. She was what a gracious person. And it was wonderful. And, uh, and in Ireland, I'll never forget, we were invited to the mayor's uh, dinner that night. It was St. Patrick's Day dinner. And we were invited to that dinner. We'd been there broadcasting the St. Patrick's Day parade in Ireland. And so he invited us to the dinner. It was for some charity. And we went to the dinner. And I thought, well, good. We'll hear some good Irish music tonight. This is going to be great. So we got there. And the first song the band played was deep in the heart of Texas. <laughs> the next one was In the Mood. <laughs> I had a hard time hearing Irish music that day. People have told me uh, a memorable part of your morning program was at the uh, hymn at, at 7.15. It was at 6.55. The, mar the march was at 7.20. And we borrowed both of those to put into our format from the old breakfast club with Don McNeil. We had the senators start the march. Funny thing happened with that march. Uh, people would listen to the car radios, of course. Mm. And we had this, this person who was a captain in the army who was stopped at a stoplight at one of these places where there's, 
it takes a long time to change the light. It, coming from every direction. And he was stopped there when we got to the march. Yeah. And when, when Senator said forward march, we said forward march. This guy stopped on the pedal and went, Whoo! <laughs> the light hadn't changed, <laughs> but it caused quite a problem. <laughs> of all of these characters that, that uh, Jackson did, did you, did you have a favorite character that you would use? We liked Dr. Lucifer Headcold who was a band director. And he said, among other, he talked like his adenoids were giving him a serious problem. And uh, he, he would say things like, I would say, well, did the band have time to tune up? He'd say, oh, we didn't have to tune up. The instruments are tuned at the factory. <laughs> and uh, and he, uh, he was always going to Albino State Teachers College is where he was a bandmaster. Mm -hmm. Directly across the street from Gold Farms Hacienda, which overlooked the River Shannon. <laughs> Happy hour every Thursday evening. For, we'd say things like that, you know. Just to, this format really worked. I mean, 32 years on the air, that must be a record. The format changed slightly from the time we started until the time that uh, it was all over. Jackson died in 1992. But uh, when we started, we played music, and we did little bits here and there and so on. And then it got to where it was, they decided that music was out. So now it was all talk. So and you and Jackson talked the entire we, time? We talked and had interviewed the commercials. So we were overcome with commercials. We, and then interviewed. That's when interview, you had, we had lots the of guests interviews. coming in. We had lots of guests coming in. We had, uh, do you remember a guy that was in town who was a great imitator of Bill Clinton? He was, he was, looked like him and talked like him and everything else. Well, he used to come up once in a while. And one time he came up while Abe Poland was there. We had Abe Poland on for some reason or the other. And uh, so this guy was there. And so Abe thought it was really Bill Clinton. <laughs> and he says, I understand my wife is coming over to, your, to the White House to do so and so and so and so. He thought it was actually Bill Clinton. I had to get him aside and say, it's not Bill Clinton. Let's talk about your television career. You did do some TV. The first time I did TV, someone told me, advised me, that I had the perfect face for radio. So it didn't last. Yes, I, I did. When, when uh, television first came to Washington, there was WTTG, which was owned by Dumont, WMAL-TV, which was owned by the Evening Star, and there was WRC-TV, which was owned by NBC. There was WOIC, which later became WTOP, which later became WUSA. But WOIC was owned by Bamberger Broadcasting out of New Jersey. And uh, so those four stations were here, and they had live programs, a lot of live programs. Pick Tipple was on Channel 9, mm -hmm. and uh, Gene Archer and a, a group of musicians were on Channel 4, and uh, Channel 7 had Jimmy Dean and the Texas Wildcats, I think he called them. So there was a lot of live programs. So I, do you remember the Friday Night Fight sponsored by Gillette? Well, whenever they came to town, uh, they, they had a, a quartet, a barbershop quartet that sang but they did, the quartet didn't travel with them. I was the bass in that quartet <laughs> on the ABC fights. And on Wednesday night, they had, uh, Channel 7 had wrestling from Turner's Arena. And the MC at Turner's Arena it was a guy by the name of Jimmy Lake, who had a saloon down on 9th Street. And uh, he was quite a character, Jimmy Lake was. But Turner's Arena, and there was Uline Arena, which had certain... I'm going back in the day yeah. to Washington. When I came to Washington, there were streetcars. Nowadays, there are buses, but there were streetcars, and, and the streetcar would come down Wisconsin Avenue to Georgetown, and then they would have to stop over a pit where they changed from overhead trolleys to third rail. It was very interesting. They also had a streetcar that went out to Glen Echo, it was an open-air streetcar. Yeah. It was very interesting. And Glen Echo was there, we were, we were running as, as an amusement park. Tell us about your book. 
We wrote a book one time. Well, actually, we furnished the material for the book, and a news guy by the name of Ed Meyer put it together. But anyway, it sold very well. It was published by William Morrow. We were, we were doing a book tour, going about from place to place around the area. And uh, we were out at Tyson's Corner. There was a line of people with uh, books ready to, for us to autograph. We were sitting there autograph. And this little old lady came up to the head of the line and looked over and says, what's going on? And I said, well, we've written a book and we were signing it for people. And she says, what's the book about? And Jackson, being the funny guy that he was, says, well, the book is just full of, of sex and crime and violence. And she says, you can have your crime and violence. <laughs> I think I know where you're going. <laughs> That's a, that, that would be typical of you guys on, on the yeah, air, too. Right, probably. right, right. You did a lot of good uh, charity work, and, and I know about that, some of that, but mm -hmm. you just mentioned some of the things that you... Well, you, the uh, Children's Hospital, we did a golf tournament. Mm -hmm. The way the golf tournament started was when the old Washington senators were in town, one night a year they would have children's hospital night and they would people would make donations and they would put part of the gate to children's hospital well when the senators left that left this one event vacant and so we decided to have a golf tournament uh, got together out at Montgomery Village and they made the course available and so on and in the course of, uh, between people sending us, by the way, we never asked for a donation on the air. People voluntarily sent us donations. And over a period of years, we raised almost $10 million for Children's Hospital with the golf tournament and everything else. And then, uh, together with one of the real estate firms, we had, uh, we had uh, a five-mile walk and, and things like that. But 50 years in broadcasting must must be a record, isn't it? It's Probably. I don't know. I have no idea whether it's a record or not, but uh, 50 years at the same station may well be a record. Yes. One, speaking of the same station, one time we got a call from <clears throat> a guy by the name of Perry Bascom, who was a manager of WNBC in New York. He said, I want you guys to come to New York. And come up and t we said, well, we have a contract here. He said, well, Come up and talk about it anyway. So we told the manager of the station here, Andy Arkeshausen, that we were going up to talk to him about it. He said, sure, go ahead. So we went up, went up to the 65th floor of the RCA building and had lunch, and he'd outlined what all he wanted us to do. And we said, well, thank you very much. We'll get back to you. We went downstairs, got in a cab to go back to LaGuardia. And I looked at Jackson, and he looked at me, and both of us like that. And that was the end of the conversation on going to do. And do you know who, who got the job? Imus. Imus. Well, Washingtonians are pleased that you turned that down and stayed in Washington, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you. A long career in, in Washington and one of the local legends. It's been a pleasure talking with you. There's so many other things to have dealt uh, into that we just didn't have time. All right. Okay. But thank you so much for joining us My on pleasure. Out of the Believe Past. Me. Thank you. And please join us again on the next program. We're going to have some more of these continuing local legends of broadcasting. I'm Chuck Langdon. Thanks for joining us. Here for a goofy day to pass the time away and catch the world as it goes by. WMAL. And it's Hart and Weaver here on WMAL AM and FM, the Evening Star Broadcasting Company in Washington. A nice note from Mrs. Becker here, and she says that uh, she just had to write to us and tell us that. Uh, there are some honest people left in the world. She was at the post office and left her wallet there at the post office. It had money in it and everything. Mm -hmm. And she thought, well, that's that. You know, like somebody's going to pick it up and that's mm -hmm. it. She went back to the post office. And sure enough, some honest man had uh, picked up the wallet, turned it into the post office, and got everything back. The money and uh, the uh, whole smear. So Tremendous. Certainly. I uh, was amused by the um, classified advertisement that was inserted in a paper not too long ago. Someone called it to our attention and said,
had lost a wallet containing uh, personal papers, passport, all kinds of things. Pictures, uh, pictures of wife and children. Wife and children. And $300. That finder can keep the personal papers, but the $300 I have a, a sentimental attachment to. <laughs> keep the picture of my wife and kids and all my papers. And we want to thank Margaret Caudill for sending the cup of coffee down to the station. It's the only one we got. Uh, we, uh, John Brown makes coffee here, but he has a special recipe. Yes. And sometimes, uh, I mean, you can't take too much of it. Well, John Brown has the only leaded coffee. The way you we can't tell burn it because it's against the fallout regulations. And the way yeah. we tell when it's ready to serve, we put a horseshoe in it. Uh-huh. And if it floats, it's not quite ready. No. When it begins to dissolve, then, then we it's know getting, it's ready to... It's getting pretty ripe. You'll notice the birds dying as they fly <laughs> over the, our building. <laughs> That's another way to tell that the coffee's ready. It's not often you can spend a nickel and get a nickel back. No. But you can when you pay the deposit on the returnable bottle of Coca-Cola. Pay a nickel, get a nickel back. Coke is still available in three popular sizes, 16-ounce, 12-ounce, and 6.5-ounce size. Wouldn't you rather borrow Coke bottles than to buy them? Well, I know I would. That's for this sure. This way shooting. the container costs you nothing. I don't want to have a bunch of Coke bottles hanging around, and I can't give them up because I own them. Mm-hmm. No. You'd lose money on your capital investment, wouldn't you? That's right, and it's hard to write up on your income tax. I tried that one time. I had 5,000 Coke bottles, mm -hmm. and I tried to deduct them. Well, they called me up right away. Did they really? Yes. The computer just spit that thing right oh, back out. Oh, yes, it? with ice. It's now uh, <laughs> 7 before 9, WMAL time. I sure like that kind of playing. Oh, stay tuned yeah. for Paul Harvey News. Does your modern apartment need a conversation piece? Yes. <clears throat> a continental telephone, yes. a psychiatrist's couch, or a Temple rubbing, an English uh, temple rubbing. What's that? An English silver tea set, some Chinese porcelain. Well, you shop at Goodwill's Flea Market at 1218 New Hampshire Avenue Northwest. That's right on the edge of Georgetown. We'll tell you more about Goodwill and the good work they do from time to time. And I went over the there and got a flea circus. Did you really? Yeah, I'm opening today. Harden and Weaver here on WMAL AM and FM, the Evening Star Broadcasting Company in Washington. It's 9 o'clock.